check out these little beauties. These are called microgreens, and they're becoming increasingly more popular in home kitchens and in restaurant kitchens alike. Microgreens are edible plants like vegetables and herbs that are harvested early in their growth cycle, typically between seven and 21 days. According to the UMass Extension Nutrition Education Program, they're more nutrient dense than mature greens with up to 40 times more vitamins, minerals, fiber, and antioxidants than their full grown counterparts. So basically, you get nutritionally more for eating less. The microgreens market in the US is estimated at $1.74 billion in 2024 and is expected to reach a market size of $2.86 billion by 2029 at a CAGR of 10.60%. Let's compare two different types of growing methods, hydroponics versus soil-based microgreens. Our first stop on our microgreen CEA tour is right here at the microgreens farm on Johns Island in South Carolina. I have the pleasure of speaking with farmer Derek Siebert today. Thank you so much for inviting me out here. I appreciate you coming out so we can educate the world on how wonderful it is to be a farmer. And so I have so many questions, but the first one I'd like to ask is why you chose this method, the soil method, for your growing operation. We actually started with hydroponics and we acquired a garden tower, which, you know, everything is run through the tower itself. It brings the water up to the top and trickles down, so we're reutilizing the water. But what I realized was that it, a lot of that is based upon the nutrients. You have to have the right blend of nutrients, and if you don't, then you can corrupt an entire tower. So that was one of the reasons why I was really struggling with that. And the other aspect is I think the flavor profile is different from soil-based plants versus hydroponic-based. Hydroponic is beautiful, they grow, they're wonderful, they're awesome. But in my opinion, when you take a bite of it, the initial impact is, wow, that's awesome, but then it dissolves. I think the soil-based products actually have more sustenance within the plant themselves, and I didn't have to worry about juggling the nutrients to make sure I had a good crop. Across the river at Firefly Distillery sits yet another microgreens operation called King Tide Farms. And I am here now with Hamilton Horn. He is the grower. Can I call you the chief grower? Sure can. Chief growing officer at King Tide Produce. Thank you for having me here today. Thanks so much. So could you tell me why you chose the hydroponic growing method for your setup? Certainly. I think that we have a, a great culinary scene here and it has a very high demand for having consistency and high quality products. And so with the hydroponic system and having a controlled environment, uh, that allows us to really, um, really schedule our products and really schedule our produce on when and how we can deliver to those guys and make sure we are getting them what they need when they need it. Why do you think your growing method is more advantageous than other growing methods? We don't do any addition to the soil itself. This particular product that we're using is ProMix, which can be acquired at any uh, home supply store or any, any uh, garden store. The seeds are non-GMO. We can't call it organic because we're growing it inside of a container and we're using artificial lighting. But the water is from the well right here on Johns Island, South Carolina. So I don't put any additives at all. So you can eat these plants right off the top. I think a lot of people get into hydroponics thinking that they're going to alleviate themselves from all the problems found in traditional agriculture. Um, and, and you couldn't be more further from the truth. All, all you're doing is buying a new set of problems. So however we can combat some of the hotter temperatures that we have here or the colder times with the frost and things that we get, you know, there are other things with the systems going down and having to work with electronics and water, you know, is going to present its own set of problems. So I would just say it's just, it's a system that works for what I'm trying to do. Um, and I think that it's going to be looking to the future. It's going to be a system and an operation that we have to work in conjunction with traditional farmers. So it'll never replace the large scale um, food producing that we are used to with, again, traditional ag, but it'll be a nice complement to that and be able to alleviate some of the uh, some of the problems that they face outside. Do you think it's feasible to implement controlled environment agriculture on site at restaurants? But the closer to the table that you can have the food coming right out of the soil, the better off you are, the nutrients are there, the flavor profile is gigantic, and it's fresher, right? It's all awesome. And there are several places that actually do own uh, their own setups just like this um, and, and sell directly to themselves uh, and their own restaurants and establishments. So while you can do it, you know, there is a, an issue with space, but you know, it, with only being 320 square feet, it is very feasible and easily to put kind of anywhere. So with 
real estate being so expensive here, it is a lot easier to go up and, and growing vertically is one of those ways that you can kind of uh, face those challenges too. How do local CEA operations impact their communities? There's a lot of stress in the world today. And the one thing that I have learned in the past couple of years of being a farmer is that it's detoxifying to come out here and put your hands in the soil and just get back to what you're supposed to do, which is enjoying simple things in life. And if you can help create your own food, we, we know where it's coming from, you know what goes into it, you know the love and the joy that you have making it happen and sharing time with your, your neighbors. And then it also helps with your soul. It's, it, it's amazing and I think it brings people together to realize that we can de-stress by doing simple things and helping feed each other. I mean, not having the ability to, to get food within a mile, a mile and a half of your own house, it's crazy. We live in America. We should have food everywhere. We shouldn't have anybody starving. And this is one way we can deliver it locally. You know, we, we are in a food desert right here in North Charleston. So teaming up with some of the uh, local communities and, and local um, charities around here has been very important to us. We were just at the North Charleston Public Library where they have a full kitchen and we can teach with kids. Um, and so I think having something like this, it's very exciting. You know, it's new technology-wise, and, and kids love things like that, so we can get them involved. And I think we can bring back the importance of having this relationship with our food. And so being very tight in a community, especially like this, that doesn't have a lot of resources for uh, healthy uh, local food, uh, I think we can start kind of, again, exciting those children about learning where their food comes from, the healthy things about their food, and, and realizing that it doesn't all come uh, you know, in a bag of chips. Could microgreens be the solution that the restaurant industry is looking for? They're full of bioactives, they're tasty, and you don't need to eat a lot of them to get your nutrients for the day. That is a very unique flavor. Perhaps eventually we'll see more of these operations popping up as a solution to the supply chain, not just for microgreens, but for all types of produce. And as always, you can check out all the great content that we've done by heading over to our website, foodinstitute.com.